Hi there everyone and welcome to this video on Smart Learning. The Smart Learning Initiative is aimed to maximise students' minds by taking what we know from the field of psychology and applying it to learning at Wilmslow High School. What I'm going to show you today is a brief run through of what the students will be doing in their first tutorial session so you can get an idea of how the process is going to work. Psychology is the study of the mind and we want to take research from psychology and make it directly relevant to learning at Wilmslow High School. We're going to be introducing strategies to students with the aim that these will work with their minds rather than against them to help them to form long term memories a bit more naturally. The advice that they're going to be given can be broken into three main phases of learning before, during and after. As this slide shows, before learning is where we focus on helping students understand that they're in a state of readiness to learn, or perhaps to recognise that they're not. The during phase is the work of learning, so this is selecting the right strategies in the classroom and at home to make that independent work really pay off. And finally, the after phase is the bit that students can sometimes overlook. It's the practice of remembering or recalling information that's crucial to help strengthen long term memory. And it's also when students carefully evaluate what they do know and what they don't know so far. We'll be saying to students that in their first session, we're going to be focused on the during phase. So that phase in the middle, and we're going to be looking at different strategies to help them learn a bit better in the classroom. The changes that are brought about by social distancing do mean that students are going to need to be more self-sufficient with their work and more independent. Teachers are going to be teaching from the front with less opportunity to circulate the room. So this does raise challenges. So the Smart Learning Initiative brings together lots of different ideas, tips and techniques that teachers are already teaching students in a number of different lessons. The idea is just to collect this all in one place. They're going to be sent information on Firefly, including things like videos by a number of different teachers so that they can really get a handle on when to use the techniques and for what types of information. The advice we're going to give to students is that they probably have their own learning habits that are quite resistant to change, but we want them to take a risk and to try these new techniques. The research does support that they will learn better if they use them, so we want them to go out on a limb a little bit and really try something new to avoid wasting lots of time, energy and stress on things that they might have done in the past, but to be honest, we're just not working. So tutees are going to introduce smart learning to students and go through some activities. I'm going to run through those with you now so you get a flavour of what they've done in their first tutorial session. The first thing we're going to ask students is how they learn. So we're going to get them to imagine that they've got some information to learn for a test and get them to discuss exactly how they go about doing this, writing down ideas and sharing them with their class. Then we're going to have a class discussion about it. Next, we're going to help introduce the brain to them for those that don't know much about it. There's a quick YouTube clip there. Um, I can send that out separately and I won't play it now. But it's basically the idea that the brain is highly interconnected and that our memories work by certain pathways in the brain becoming strengthened when we practice or recall information again and again. Then we're going to move on to the science of learning and we're going to focus in on something called cognitive psychology, which is a branch of psychology that's really devoted to the study of mental processes. So it's perfect for understanding how students learn. A really key feature we're going to draw out of cognitive psychology is something called schemas. And schemas are just pictures that we can draw that help understand how knowledge is organised in our minds. Basically, the idea is that the more we know about something, the more complex and developed that schema is. This picture here shows you a schema for cats, and it shows you lots of different things that you might know about cats. But as you learn more about them, your schema develops. So, for example, some cats are born without a tail, and once we know that Manx cats don't have a tail, we can update our schema and make it more developed and complicated. We're then going to ask students to do the same thing, but using the uh, key title of sport. So on a new page, they're going to write down everything they know about it in a similar way to the previous slide on cats, but they're going to try and develop it and put as much information in as they can in five minutes. 
So there should be lots of opportunity to put tons in there about players, different sports grounds and places, diagrams about how sports games work and the rules for each game. The idea is that students would need way more time than this to do it completely, but that some students will do it more naturally and better than others. We're then going to have a discussion of whose schema was the most developed and why, and the chances are those that are more interested in sport will have a more developed schema. They'll probably be the students who can learn new information about sports more easily. So the idea with schema is that having that structure already in place gives some way of adding new information. So basically learning is a self-sustaining loop. The more we know, the more we have a structure to add more information to it. So new knowledge can stick to old knowledge in our existing schema. If you look at it this way, schools are all about developing the schemas or understanding of students in lots of different topics. So if we wanted to apply this across the school, we might think about, let's say, the schema for our bodies from biology. A year seven schema for the human body might be less developed than a student who is going through the school into year 11 and hopefully much less developed than a student doing biology in year 13. We're going to ask the question of what student schemas would be like for things like Shakespeare or ancient Rome or glaciers to really make the point that what we're doing is trying to help support them to learn by adding new information to what they already know. Next, we're going to have a look at some misconceptions about learning. So psychologists are really interested in these. There's a series of different statements, and we're going to ask students to rearrange these in rank order with the ones that they believe the most at the top and the least at the bottom. So literally just rewriting the letters. If you want to pause this video and have a go at it now, it's probably a good idea. Or if you've not got an opportunity to do that now, um, maybe try and do it later. But it's really good to get you thinking about some of these ideas and when you when you believe in them. The other thing that we should be doing at this stage is putting a tick next to the ones that you think are supported by scientific research. So it turns out that all of these are misconceptions and that none of them have been effectively supported by scientific research. But when asked this, participants in a psychological study actually rated different um, statements as, as more or less likely. So what you can see here in the numbers are at the top of the table with 93% is the idea that students are either visual, auditory or kinesthetic learners. So that was the statement that was believed the most, despite the fact that there's not much scientific evidence to support that. The idea of the Smart Learning Initiative, in part, is to try and reject some of these faulty or misconceptions. And try and waste and try and avoid wasting lots of time and efforts on things that aren't actually effective in the classroom. So next, a big focus is going to be attention, particularly given the restrictions with social distancing. Smart learning is about getting information to stick, as I've said repeatedly, but a problem that we have in classrooms normally before lockdown, and I'm sure after lockdown will be students zoning out and not paying attention to what's being said. And we've all had moments like this. There's times when we're thinking about what we're going to have for tea that evening rather than actually concentrating on what we should be focusing on. So we're going to ask students, are they present when they're in the classroom? And really impressing on them the need to be there mentally to be able to learn. If they're not paying attention to information, it's just going to get filtered out and it's not going to find its way into their long term memories. There are lots of factors that affect lost attention, and we're going to discuss that in tutor groups as well. Things like sleep hygiene, emotional distractions, diet, exercise, substances like caffeine, as well as the concept of students revising to music and having their electron electronic devices nearby, which are an obvious distraction. After that, we're going to focus on short term memory. This is a concept that psychologists use to try and test how we pay attention to or focus on information. So we're going to test students short term memory with a task where they have to remember a certain number of digits. After they've tried to write these digits down, we're going to give them the answers and the number's going to get bigger each time. So it does get harder and harder. But the idea is to sh show students that their attention only has a limited capacity.
Here's the first number to remember, and then students should write it down. If they get it right, and so far they've managed five items. If you want to play along with this, feel free. Here's the next number. You've got a few seconds to watch it. When it disappears, it's only then that you can write it down. Here's the number, see if you got it right. And that means you're up to six items. Try and write it down now. If you've got that one right, you're up to seven items. Here's the next number getting more difficult now. This one is above average for short-term memory capacity, if you can manage it. Well done if you got that right. And technically the next one is the absolute limit to what short-term memory can do. Well done if you got that right, you got up to nine items. Now you probably rehearsed the numbers in your head as sounds over and over again, almost like you heard yourself saying them. And that's a way we can hold short term information in our minds for a bit longer. But as I said, theoretically, that number at the bottom is the limit, but there are ways to massively expand that. So, just try this one and see how far you get. Well done if you managed it. There is a trick, however, to making sure that you can get that information into your long-term memory and make it stick really easily. And the idea is to convert it into something meaningful. So if you struggled with this number and just gave up, try this instead. Remember the story that on bonfire night last year, you called a Wilmslow phone number to buy Dalmatians. So I'll decode this for you. The 0511 is a date of bonfire night. Last year, 2019, the Wilmslow phone number 01625 and then 101 Dalmatians. Now I want you to try it again on a blank piece of paper where you can't see your previous answer. probably manage that much easier. Now this type of meaningful information is what psychologists call semantic information. It sticks directly in long-term memory much more easily. And the great thing about this is if you use such simple techniques, you'll be able to get information into long-term memory and have it retained there for a long time without even trying, whereas doing it using just practice and rehearsal with the sounds is not going to be as effective. So the point we're trying to make here with all of the students is that we can have a discussion about how these ideas about making something meaningful can help our long term memories. And we can apply that to either the classroom or their learning at home. And we're going to have a discussion about that in tutor groups. Next, we're going to ask students what subjects they learn the most in. So we're going to be asking them how they learn the information, how teachers make that stick and also how the classroom is managed to make the uh, learning a bit more conducive. Next, we're going to focus on the difference between easy and difficult tasks. When we're doing an easy task, we've got lots of mental capacity left over for distractions and um, other tasks that we might be wanting to do at around the same time. But if the task's difficult, we've got far less mental capacity to dictate to other things. 
And the point we're making here is that in lessons where it should be difficult, students shouldn't be focusing on anything other than the task at hand. If they're distracted by their peers, then they're going to be really uh, under pressure to remember any information that's coming from the teacher. So the picture at the bottom of the slide there is the key one when it comes to lessons. We need less distractions so that they can be more focused on the difficult task. This next one is a bit of a bugbear of a lot of teachers. When you ask students how they revise, they tend to say that they just reread their notes. So we're going to ask students which of them do just that and which students try and recall the information, let's say, onto a blank piece of paper, that's called free recall, with no help from their notes at all. Psychologists looked at this question too, and some really interesting findings came out of it. There's a difference between predicted performance and actual performance. If you look at students who just reread their notes before an exam, they predict that they're going to do much better, hence this bar here. The students who try and do free recall, so they write all the information out from scratch, think that they're going to do much worse on the exam. That's this bar here. But then when we come to actual performance and looking what the test scores are, the relationship flips around. So students who reread their notes actually do worse than students who do the recall practice, even though before the test they thought they were going to do better and worse respectively. So we're going to make this point to the students. Those who reread their notes think they're going to do better, but those who actually practice remembering the information do better in the real thing. Now the reason for this is something called the illusion of mastery or fluency. When we reread things, we recognise them, so that tricks us into thinking we know the information better than we actually do. But this is an illusion, because making the effort leads to a stronger memory. Doing that practice of recall is actually really going to bring back the information when it counts. So to bring everything together, students are going to be covering lots of different things in that first tutorial session. Things about schemas, ideas that are supported by science and those that aren't, why attention is vital, our short-term memory capacity, and you might have played along with that, how we can convert information into meaning to help make learning stick, lessons where they learn the most and why, easy and difficult tasks, and the difference between reading and recalling for their memories. We're going to ask them to make one learning promise to themselves based on the day and they're going to carry that through the academic, academic year. Hopefully they'll have a chance to discuss what they've chosen. And that's it for smart learning. So as I said at the start, the idea is going to be to introduce lots of different concepts from psychology to students across the school year with the idea of trying to maximise their minds.